Ancient cultures around the world spoke of uh, a vast cycle of time with alternating dark and golden ages, something that Plato termed the great year. But the Greeks weren't the only ones to talk about it. Many different cultures spoke of it. The Indians called it the Yuga cycle. Uh, the Mayans referred to it as different suns. The Hopis as different worlds. What's important is we find this story of these rising and falling ages throughout so many cultures and so many myths. And I'll play a quick clip from our video here. Lost civilizations, the golden age, Shangri-La. Might there be some truth to these ancient tales? Our ancestors spoke of a grand cycle bringing about high ages of enlightenment and low ages of darkness, marked by the movement of the heavens. The notion of individuals in their own place of worship being connected to some larger, either terrestrial or cosmic space, is not uncommon. Mayan astronomy looked at huge cycles of movements of stars. They actually had an exact date in their calendar for the beginning of the world. The evidence for these advanced civilizations is, is almost universal in the sense that they seem to be at their height, very near the beginning. Just as day and night are caused by the spinning Earth, and the seasons are caused by the Earth's orbit around the sun, some ancient cultures believed there's an even larger cycle that influences the rise and fall of civilizations. History and astronomy may help us rediscover this forgotten cycle, a cycle said to be so vast it reaches beyond our solar system, yet affects our everyday lives. Plato called it the Great Year. Okay, so what do we really know about cultures that are 5,000 years old? I'm a big uh, Star Trek fan, always enjoyed the shows, particularly the early episodes. There's one called The Menagerie, where Captain Kirk and Spock, they go off to another world uh, around another star, and uh, because they've heard that a Federish, Federation ship is missing, and um, they want to find out if there's any survivors. And they get there, and, and sure enough, uh, a Federation ship has gone down, and there is one girl that has survived. And the good news is that the beings on this other planet are uh, of a very high intelligence. So they're able to uh, save this young girl and, and put her back together. And the bad news is they had never seen a human before. So when they put her together, she kind of ended up, up in a, a grotesque form. And that's what it's like when we're trying to figure out what civilizations were like 5,000 years ago, except we're the aliens. We have no clue really what these civilizations are like because all that is left is a bit of rock and stone. That's about all that lasts. And so we try to fit them into our own paradigm of whatever came earlier must be more primitive. And I'm not so certain we're always making uh, the right decisions there. A case in point is uh, Corral, Peru. Corral, uh, when I was a little boy, they taught us that uh, the Americas uh, were you know, discovered by Columbus when he sailed the ocean blue in 1492 and that uh, anything built here in the Americas was done by the Incans. And you know, the Incans are really only five, six, seven hundred years old, something like that. But they, uh, they did find a few sites that uh, they thought were older than that, and, and this is one, and, and archeologists began to investigate in 1997. And you can see that there's uh, three pyramids in the, in the background there. There's six pyramids total. 
And unlike the Egyptian pyramids, they didn't have big blocks of stone to, to create from. And so they cobbled together smaller uh, groups of stones, put them in square baskets, and then the baskets were lowered into place. And that's how they would build this pyramid. Well, it turns out that's a, a great way to carbon date uh, a stone structure, which isn't normally uh, datable in this method because the plant material that the baskets were made out of uh, was almost hermetically sealed between these rocks. And so you know that that material was there when the pyramid was built. Anyway, they took samples of that, sent it off to University of Chicago, and uh, got the results back and just about fell off their chairs because it told us that these pyramids are 4,700 years old. And that is... Uh, just about contemporaneous, contemporaneous with many of the Egyptian pyramids. And so it sort of blows the, uh, the theory of history that, that I was taught when I was a little boy, which was that uh, civilization settled first in the uh, you know, Egyptian area, the, the Fertile Crescent there uh, near the Tigris and Euphrates River in Mesopotamia. But when you find structures that are just as old in the, in the Americas as they are in the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, you have to really question what we know about history. Another common history uh, theory tenet is that early civilizations got together to fight off against other warring tribes. But what I've noticed in many of these early sites is that you don't find a lot of weaponry or walls. And Corral is a case in point where they found a lot of evidence of trade, uh, uh, cotton goods, different sorts of fabrics, uh, many different types of shellfish, uh, and um, musical instruments, but no weaponry really of any kind. I should say Corral is, uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's on the Peruvian course, uh, coast maybe about 15 miles in, about 100 miles from Lima. There's some indication of some, uh, some alignments there. I don't think it's been thoroughly investigated yet. So the story I want to tell today is just sort of giving a context uh, for, for some of these sort of anomalous artifacts that we're finding that look out of place in our present view of history. Again, when I was a boy uh, and they told us that Columbus uh, discovered America just 500 years ago, I had asked my teacher, well, why didn't they get here earlier? And my teacher said, well, they didn't have boats that were big enough. And uh, that's really what they taught in the schools and of course, they hadn't found the boats that were buried in the Giza Sands uh, back in the 50s then. And, and they did, I think they found the first one in the early 60s, and they found uh, eight others since. And this one is uh, 140 feet long, uh, found near the Great Pyramid. And Columbus's ships were 70 feet long on average. So they're twice the, the length of Columbus's ships. I, I think we certainly had the ability to get to the Americas earlier. Here's another anomalous artifact. Some of you have seen the uh, television shows on the Antikythera device. This was found in a shipwreck that unquestionably dates to about 100 BC or so, give or take a few decades, off the Isle of Antikythera in the Aegean Sea by Greek sponge divers. And when they brought this up, which they thought was an anchor, uh, it was corroded with <coughs> coins and amphora, and it made it very easy to date uh, that shipwreck and when this had gone down. And this actually sat in the museum at Athens there for about 50 years until uh, I heard that somebody had knocked it over, and that's when they discovered that there were some uh, geared devices inside. A matter of fact, uh, 32 precision gears inside. And the problem with this, again, is that we were taught that uh, geared devices weren't developed until 12, 13, 1400 AD in the great clockmaking era here in Europe. 
And so you really shouldn't have anything like this uh, back that far. And if, if uh, this is, uh, if the scientists are correct, then apparently some of these uh, ride on a, a rotating gear, which is called a differential gear. And that wasn't even developed until uh, here in England around the year 1800 or so. So it's almost 2,000 years out of place, if you will. A few scientists uh, got together and made a copy of it, and they found that it, it's more than just a simple geared device to, uh, you know, to help turn a mill or something like that. It appears to be a, a type of computer to plot the orbits of the planets and, and the moon and the sun. And this is known because the gear ratios uh, exactly fit the, the timing ratios of the planets going around the sun. Again, when I was a boy, they taught us the battery was developed, you know, post-Renaissance by Volta, about the year 1700 or so. And that's what we thought until they found the Baghdad batteries. These are at least 2,000 years old. They're not quite certain because the, uh, the soil was disturbed. So they might be as old as 4,000 years old. But either way, they're almost 2,000 years out of place plus and while this battery looks very crude, uh, if you put some uh, acidic juice in it, grape juice or something like that, vinegar, you will get about twice the voltage as you got from Volta's first battery in the year 1700. And how about dentistry? You know, uh, they couldn't drill teeth very well uh, just 100 years ago because they didn't have the drills. and and. Uh, if you were in California, where I come from, uh, 100 years ago, if you had a bad tooth, you'd go to the barber shop, they'd fill you full of whiskey, and they'd yank that thing out, and that was dentistry. <clears throat> About eight years ago, they found 13 skulls in Pakistan that date to 8,000 years old. And uh, one of the anthropologists happened to notice that this looked a lot like uh, teeth that had been drilled, the rear molars there. And um, they took it to a modern day dentist and he said, sure enough, that's what it is. And although the filling material isn't there anymore, he said that was very, very good work because you can see that they used different sizes of drills and they were able to uh, drill quite a bit of this tooth without breaking or chipping off the enamel. And then this, uh, the right hand picture, there is uh, an anthropologist's idea of how they might have done this. They took a piece of flint, put it in a stick, so the explanation goes, and somehow spun that thing very rapidly to, uh, to drill these teeth. And, you know, it's really, uh, a, I suppose it's possible, but it's kind of ridiculous because you can't fit a stick uh, that's big enough into the back of the mouth to get enough torque on this thing to really do it properly. And if you do that, you're not gonna get the quality of dentistry that was practiced here. They've also found uh, orthodontics in uh, Egypt that go back almost 5,000 years. Some of the discoveries that are being made are things that we still do not know how to recreate. And one of these is terra preta do indio, this, uh, this amazing soil they've been finding in great quantities in Brazil. <clears throat> when the local Indians come across this, they get very excited because they know that this soil is so rich compared to the normal jungle soil, the, the lighter soil on the other side, that they can grow a papaya in uh, almost half the time and get just about twice the yield. Um, so the samples of this soil were taken to Cornell University uh, really over the last 20, 30 years they've been studying this. And they found that it's, uh, it's an amazing material. It's, uh, it has about five billion uh, microorganisms per cubic centimeter. And it seems to have a yogurt type quality where as long as you don't take too much of it away, it'll slowly grow back. And uh, they tried to recreate it. Uh, they find a lot of uh, pottery shards, uh, in the soil so they know it was man-made. Uh, they also find a lot of uh, carbon in there. So they've been playing with uh, sort of different uh, 
recipes, if you will, but uh, they've still not been able to recreate the soil. And they, they've, it's been found in uh, two to four hectare plots uh, all along sort of the main waterways there in Brazil. The, the dating on it is, is really hard to tell because you can't date the pottery, of course, but uh, there were some uh, broken pieces of pot that they found some uh, food substance, plant material in it, and those date to about eight or 9,000 years ago. Uh, so it's, it appears to be uh, that there was a pretty advanced civilization there a long, long time ago. <clears throat> Can't give a talk in England without uh, talking about one of the great uh, stone monuments here, which I guess we're all going to go see on Monday, huh? Yeah, you. Looking forward to it. Okay. Uh, Hugh earlier had mentioned uh, John Burke. Uh, he was a dear friend who did a lot of work at Avebury. He spent a month there and took uh, a magnetometer uh, to test the stones. And as you probably know, when stones come out of the ground, uh, they have a polarity to them. The, the part that faced the, uh, the North Pole when the stone was formed uh, will have a slight positive charge, the part that face the South Pole will have a negative charge. This, this is basically in all stones. And uh, geologists uh, use this sometime for certain reasons, but uh, John was uh, curious if ancients were aware of these uh, properties. And what he found was of the 66 remaining stones at Avebury, they're all arranged so that the uh, positive uh, side faces the next stone in line. And the, the odds of being able to align something this just by accident are basically the same odds as flipping a coin 66 times and having it come up heads every time, which is uh, something in excess of a billion to one. So it appears that this, uh, whoever built Avebury knew that uh, the polarity of these stones and uh, we don't know why they did it, but it is a pattern that's very similar to uh, the Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland. <clears throat> and I'm not saying that these uh, ancients use this to uh, accelerate particles like we do with the very powerful magnets today, but that they had some purpose to, of doing it that we still have not discovered. And that's the point that that uh, these ancient cultures really had a lot of knowledge that was lost as you go into the Dark Ages and then came back sometime later. And I've just scratched the surface, but you know we all know that the uh, democratic system was uh, widely used in many ancient cultures, and the Greeks, for example. The, <clears throat> the heliocentric system was talked about by Aristarchus of Samos and, and Archimedes. And uh, that was about almost 1,000 years before the year 500 AD. And then 1,000 years after that year 500 AD, of course, Copernicus brought that theory back to us. Uh, they've been finding some amazing uh, evidence of hydraulic engineering and in Mesopotamia and, and Syria, these quanats. And, um, you know, evidence of mathematics, astronomy, uh, in the Indus Valley, Harappa, Mohenjo-Daro, they, they built many of the uh, buildings with uniform uh, bricks that are uh, just about to the golden ratio. And uh, they also have uh, indoor uh, heating and municipal plumbing systems. Uh, there's evidence of those in parts of Harappa. And you know, you think about when did uh, sewer systems come to England finally, you know? Just three, four hundred years ago, it wasn't that pleasant walking down the streets here. And uh, these are all things that somehow uh, ancient mankind knew about, and they were lost as we went into the Dark Ages and, and then were rediscovered. <laughs> Matter of fact, uh, you know, if you look at ancient Egypt, it seems to be near its height, near the beginning, and then it goes downhill, becoming almost a nomadic society by the time of the Dark Ages. Uh, if you look at 
the Sumer, Akkad, Babylon, similar situation. It becomes uh, just run over tribal sort of civilization that can't build anything by the time of the Dark Ages. And, you know, people say, well, what about China? If you look closely at China, there's uh, tremendous evidence of astronomy in the, uh, those er the early uh, uh, bones. Many of the, uh, uh, much of the astronomical knowledge is placed there. And some of the jewelry they could make uh, that, that uh, just goes completely out of favor. And by the Han Dynasty, you know, they're chopping people up in the streets. Now let me talk about a few of the individuals that have noticed this idea of a great cycle and, and I can summarize what they said about it. Swami Sri Yukteswar is the guru of Paramahansa Yogananda, a great Indian sage, lived in the middle, uh, later 1800s, uh, died in 1936. And he wrote a little book called The Holy Science, and it's really about the enlightenment process uh, meant for devotees. But in just passing at the beginning of this book, the introduction, he says, oh, by the way, this stuff might not be too understandable right now because we're in the, in the uh, lower ages, still very close to the dark ages. And he gives a quick explanation that, that uh, when, when our solar system is a, at a certain distance from another star, uh, we're in the dark ages, and when we go around this star and get closer to another point in space, uh, it uh, helps out consciousness. So he didn't really say much more than that, but uh, he did expound a little bit on this, the cycle that this solar system motion produces, which in India they call the yugas. And we'll talk about that a little more in a minute. Two other scholars that uh, noticed this cycle are Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha von Deschen. Giorgio was a, a physics professor, the uh, professor of the history of science at MIT when he got together with Hertha von Deschen to write Hamlet's Mill. And Hamlet's Mill looks at over 200 myths uh, from, uh, it's over 30 cultures, might be close to 40 cultures, and they took a very objective uh, view in this book. What they were trying to do is discover the, the origins of human knowledge. And they figured, well, that might have something to do with early mankind. He was watching the stars. That might have led to mathematics. And, and uh, that's probably all true. But they also noticed that Many of these cultures seem to be fascinated with the motion of the heavens, something we call procession, and that they tied different epochs of mankind to it. They tied uh, you know, a higher age or a lower age to, to these different phases of procession. So if the equinox is in Aries, you know, they would say that this is a very high age, and if, it's, if the autumnal equinox is in the opposite sign, they would say it's a low age. So. Uh, I'd recommend this book if you haven't read it. It's a little heavy, but uh, it gives you some great information on how much knowledge there is about this ancient cycle. And uh, a modern uh, scholar that's uh, written about it to some degree is Stefan Maul. He is probably the foremost Assyrianologist in the world. He's German, won the Leibniz Prize, so he got to, you know, just spend five years just uh, studying these tablets. He already understood the cuneiform better than most scholars out there, but he would say that, uh, you know, we found uh, almost 200,000 of these uh, tablets. We've only read 1% uh, or so, and he says, take the word read very lightly. He says, we really are beginning to understand that we understand very little. What he found, uh, a couple things, is one, that uh, the ancients were fascinated with archaeology themselves. So the, the Babylons, uh, say 600 BC, 2600 years ago or so, uh, they were practicing archaeology. When they would find an ancient structure, they would try to put it back together without deviating an eyelash. 
They felt that something was sacred and important about these old structures. Uh, also, they uh, talked about the, the cycle of the great year. They, they had a different name for it, but uh, they looked back to the last golden age as a time to try to emulate. And they feared the coming dark age that they knew they were going into. And isn't it interesting that they were absolutely correct because they, they, they virtually lost all knowledge in that area. And he found one other interesting thing I'd like to mention. He uh, follows the etymology of the words and he, he noticed that the, the ancient words for past have become our words for future. And the ancient words for future have become our words for past. If you think about this in terms of the great year cycle, you kind of orient yourself towards the golden age. They were closer to the golden age than we were because they were on the other side of the dark ages. And they were trying to hang on to those higher times, the buildings, the structures, the customs, uh, but they were forgetting, they were losing this information. Uh, but they, they viewed that as sort of like the future, that's where they wanted to go, if you will. And uh, they saw themselves kind of going into the past, whereas, of course, we wouldn't want to go back a thousand years right now when, you know, every dookie, every uh, county here in uh, Europe is at war with one another uh, and plagues ravage the earth. The lifespans are about half what they are now. You know, even 500 years ago, still every nation was at war with each other. Uh, so they... Uh, they were, they were aware, apparently, the ancient Babylonians of, of a golden age and a darker age, and they saw themselves uh, moving in the wrong direction at the time. The ancient teachings about the, the cycle are, are a little bit vague, uh, but we do find the symbology of the uh, cycle in the Greco-Roman culture, the, the Mithraic temples especially. We can thank the Christians for the preservation of uh, this culture because these temples were built just below ground level. And uh, when the Christians came along, they, they filled them up with trash, used them as bins, and it, it had the odd effect of preserving many of the uh, sculptures down there. So this is the main troctony that you found in these uh, old Mithraic temples, which this was a culture probably at 200 BC to 200 AD or so. And uh, here Perseus uh, is slaying Taurus. And you always have these two little guys on the side. One is uh, Cautes, and he holds a torch up. And then Cautopides holds a torch down. And that's uh, been interpreted as uh, sort of the light and dark age. Also, Mithras, their main god, he's the one that uh, turns the zodiac, if you will. And here you can see him in uh, one of the classic zodiacs. He's holding a torch up at that period when we were in the rising ages. You'll notice Aries on the top there, and then um, Pisces, Aquarius, etc. You know, as soon as just 20 years ago, uh, archaeologists, anthropologists didn't even recognize this as the zodiac. They just thought this is, uh, you know, pagan uh, animal worship stuff. And of course, it's it's very much much an astronomical science. Here's a quick clip on uh, what one of the uh, scholars has to say about this. Let's see, we don't have the sound again. And this allows Mithras to both be the sun, Mithras Sol Invictus, Mithras the unconquerable sun, and also seem to be operating for the sun or on behalf of the sun. So we think that this was one culture that was aware of uh, of this relationship that so many cultures had talked about, this cycle of the ages. And let me just orient you uh, with the zodiac here real quick. So the zodiac is, 
if you just take the 12 constellations that surround the Earth and you flatten it into a planisphere, that's what the zodiac is. And then, of course, the, uh, the equinox would, would go around it like an hour hand. So that's the celestial clock, if you will. And the, the zodiacs represent the 12 numbers. So um, Aries is, uh, was considered the, the highest age here when the autumnal equinox was in Aries. And what's interesting nowadays, we tend to use the, uh, the vernal equinox, the spring equinox. You see that uh, many cultures, uh, well, the hippies, for example, talk about this is the, we're in Pisces at the dawning of the age of Aquarius. And indeed, that is where the, the spring equinox is right now. But the ancients, uh, as far as we can tell, often use the autumnal equinox, and that puts us very close to the bottom of the uh, cycle. And this is what Sri Yukteswar taught, too, that we're just barely coming out of the dark ages on our way up. OK, so what is procession? <clears throat> So that we have these 12 constellations around us. And if uh, every day as the Earth spins, we can see uh, a different constellation over us every two hours or so, assuming you could just see the sky at all times. That's easy to understand, because that happens in such a short period of time. We know it. Uh, and then as the Earth spins around, as the Earth revolves around the sun, uh, obviously, that takes longer than the daily spin on its axis, and that will put a different constellation overhead roughly each month. And those, in, that, in those first two motions of the Earth, the stars are rising in the east and setting in the west. Well, there's another motion that Copernicus and others have noticed, and that is that if you look just on the date of the equinox, the stars seem to be going slightly backwards. Uh, retrograde, about 50 arc seconds per year. And at that rate, every 2,000 years or so, you'll have a different constellation overhead. That is the observable of the precession of the equinox. Copernicus, of course, didn't know that the solar system moved, so he said the Earth must wobble. Then uh, Newton came along 100 years later, uh, 150 years later, and said, well, gee, if the Earth wobbles, uh, it must be due to the gravity of the sun and the moon. And in Newton's time, they didn't know that the sun moved either, that the solar system moved. And so we developed this uh, loony solar theory of precession, is what it's called, where it's presumed that the, the Earth, which is a little oblate, is, uh, is wobbled by the gravity of the sun and the moon. And uh, this is kind of how that goes. And I don't question the fact that the, the uh, sun and the moon have a gravitational effect on us. Obviously, the sun holds us, and, and the moon does go above and below the equator with the Cero cycle every 9.3 years above, 9.3 years below. We use this cycle to plot eclipses, and that will cause a little nutation. They didn't know about nutation when they made up the, uh, the loony solar theory, by the way. Uh, and so when, nowadays, when uh, astronomers try to plot precession, they, they use radio telescopes, they look out to distant quasars, and they determine how much the Earth wobbled in relation to that point. But because the theories of, of precession uh, are all based on a static solar system, a non-moving sun, they constrain solar system motion to zero. And it really gets uh, some problems going. And we've had, uh, there's many scientists that have been writing about the problems with loony solar theory. And so basically, there's a far simpler theory that I am trying to uh, get scientists to look at once again. And it's this theory of Sri Yukteswar that Precession is simply caused by the solar system curving through space. And if we are in a binary system, then 
then that's what it looks like as our solar system curves through space. You go around another star, you go a little faster when you get close to it, and a little farther when you go farther away. And you would, that would give us the exact same observable as precession. So it really doesn't matter what the cause of precession is. We both have the same observables. But in, in this model, instead of having 1,200 inputs to wobble the Earth, uh, you just have, we just see the different constellations. We go through the precession process by the solar system moving. And of course, you know, when Copernicus was around, they didn't know about binary systems. And even in Newton's time, they were considered very rare, just, you know, hypothetical things. And it's just the last 50 years we've realized, oh, most stars have partners. In fact, uh, the latest Chandra survey is that 80% uh, of all stars, if you count brown dwarfs, are in partner relationships. Stars like other stars as much as, you know, people like other people. They like to have relationships. And so the question is, you know, why wouldn't our own sun have a, have a companion? And if you use this binary model to predict the precession rate, you will find that it's uh, 41 times more accurate than the current precession rate right now. This is just over the last uh, 100 years or so. Just take 1900 to the year 2000. The precession rate, the annual rate, has been increasing from 50.255 arc, 50 arc seconds to 50.260, 50.265, et cetera. And as precession speeds up each year, the periodicity, the cycle of precession, uh, it gets shorter and shorter. And so at the turn of the century, the precession cycle was thought to take 25,800 years or so. Now it's thought to take 25,700 years. You know, 100 years from now, it'll, it'll be shorter and shorter. And, and I think they'll get very close to uh, what Euctus War says, 24,000 years, because when we plug 24,000 years into the model, we get uh, uh, the exact curve that the actual precession observables are, are are at today. So that's about, that's the end of the uh, complicated part. I'm, I'm sorry for, for that. And any of you that are really into that, we can get into some math later. But uh, this, this 24,000 year figure is kind of interesting because it means that our system of time is a microcosm of the great year. We have 12 hours of AM, increasing light, 12 hours of PM, increasing darkness, for a total of 24 hours. That's a little microcosm of 12,000 years of ascending age, 12,000 years of descending age, uh, for 24,000 years in the cycle. It seemed to be something the ancients liked to do, as they would tie in either geodetic or, uh, or time relationships. A little bit more on the binary stuff, then we'll get off it. If we are in a binary system, you know, what kind of star could it be? And there's a number of different candidates. Uh, there are scientists. Uh, Richard Muller at the University of California, Berkeley, is looking for a brown dwarf. So is Whitmire and Matisse at the University of Louisiana and a few others. Uh, I met recently with some scientists at Stanford University. They're having problems with uh, Gravity Pro B. And before it was sent up, I said, you're going to see something that looks like precession, even though you're above a wobbling Earth. And they uh, wrote me just a little form letter back and said, thank you for your input. And, uh, you know, a year and a half went by. They got the results back. They phoned me up. I had a big meeting there with uh, six of the top scientists. And they said, you know, how did you uh, know that we might be seeing something like this. And I didn't get into all the ancient stuff, but uh, so they think they're trying to go by the standard theories of gravity we, we have right now, not use MOND or anything. And so they actually think there might be a black hole nearby, something like that. So that's a candidate. And then there's uh, some exotic new types of stars that are being discovered. Uh, probably don't have time to get into that, but here's. Here's one that the ancients talked about. Um, 
and it's a star named Sirius. <laughs> there are four odd shafts in the Great Pyramid that were called air shafts. A lot of people now call them star shafts. I'm, I'm not really sure what they are, but uh, the southern shaft in the uh, Queen's Chamber is aligned towards Sirius, meaning that uh, it, it points towards Sirius so that it, as the Earth spins around, it'll get back to, uh, to Sirius and uh, act as a transit telescope, if you will, for that star. And it's funny that it still does that in our time. You would have thought that, you know, maybe the Egyptians uh, designed it that way because Sirius Isis was their sort of their favorite star, their favorite god, and yet it still does it now. And this has been noticed by a number of scientists uh, throughout history, older scientists that were looking at the position of Sirius on some of the old uh, zodiacs. And even Judd Buckwald, who teaches at uh, Caltech today, one of the top astronomical schools in the world, says Sirius remains about the same distance from the equinoxes and so from the solstices throughout these many centuries despite precession. And so I talked to Jed uh, fairly recently on that and I, I said, why is that? You know, shouldn't Sirius be precessing just like all the other stars? Because, you know, I know that if it's a, it's a companion star, it would be the one star that doesn't precess. It's the one star that we're gravitationally bound to. And what precession is, is really all the other stars going, going outside of our binary frame, our solar system, if you will, as we rotate around a common center of mass with our companion. And he said, yeah, it is odd about Sirius, but it's something about the horizon there at Luxor. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I haven't told him yet about the, uh, the Homans research in Canada. They, they've been measuring Sirius for over 20 years, I have a telescope in the basement, points right to Sirius. They show no precession whatsoever related to the star Sirius. And uh, they're certainly not at the same latitude as Luxor. Now there's tons of problems, you know, from a traditional astronomical model about Sirius being a companion star. It's not the closest star. You'd think, you know, if, uh, if gravity works the way it does, our companion should be, you know, Alpha Centauri, if it is a visible star, and even that takes a great speed. Uh, and while Sirius might not be the, uh, the closest star, it is clearly the closest uh, blue giant. It's, this is a, just a graph straight out of National Geographic magazine. And it also is the only uh, uh, star close to us that has a white dwarf going around it. And this white dwarf, this neutron star, is uh, incredibly dense. You know, if water is a value of one, uh, gold is a value of 19 because gold weighs 19 times as much as water does. Sirius B, which goes around Sirius A, is a value of 53,000. It, it's super, super dense. A teaspoon full would weigh a couple of tons. Here, hold this. Uh, so uh, the Homans out of Canada who are really onto this too, they think that maybe B going around A sets up uh, some sort of a gravity wave so that perhaps uh, gravity works a little stronger with, with this blue giant white dwarf combo than it does say with some of the other stars. And this is all in the early, early stages. I, I'm just throwing it out there to, to get other people to investigate it. But, but it's funny, as you look at some of the ancient cultures, you know, they talk about uh, this star in, in, in many different ways. Uh, I know that Sitchin says Nibiru is something else, but all the good scholars that I've listened to say that Nibiru, and they get it right out of the Epic of Gilmash here. Nibiru is the star which in the skies is brilliant. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky, brighter than any other star by a factor of three. And uh, it would act as a crossing star. That would be the one star, if we're gravitationally bound to it, because it's moving with the sun, it would cross all the other stars. 
And there's some great uh, Arabic references about Sirius being on the other side of the Milky Way from where it is now. Also, the Shinto religion, uh, they call Sirius our second son. They align their temples to it. Uh, one of the members of parliament in uh, Japan today has a book out uh, talking about Sirius. And certainly the Egyptians were, uh, were very big on this star. To them it was Isis. Isis had this special relationship with Horus. Uh, while we don't understand all the Egyptian iconography, we do know that Horus is often uh, some aspect of the sun. And you can see that when uh, Sirius and the sun, Isis, Horus are small, she seems to be uh, suckling them, taking care of them. And here when, when, it's, when he's older, she seems to be turning them, pulling his arm uh, with her left hand and patting him with his uh, right hand. So I, I, don't, I don't understand all the iconography. We've talked to a lot of specialists on it, and I, I get as many different opinions as people I talk to. Uh, the plane of our solar system is like this. Sirius is 17 degrees below the plane of our solar system. Uh, if it does have some gravitational effect on us, it's going to pull the outer, lighter planets a little harder than those that are close to the sun. Pluto is 17 degrees off plane, exactly towards uh, Sedna. Since I wrote, or towards Sirius, and since I wrote the book, they found Sedna, which is in about the, uh, the same plane there. So it looks at as you get farther away from our sun, more and more things are sort of pointing towards Sirius, if you will. OK, I, I've got a whole set of other talk here I have to go through in two minutes, it looks like. <laughs> so if we are gravitationally bound to another star, then how does that other star affect us? How could how could we be having rising and falling ages? And there's a physicist friend of mine that says uh, we'd be going around on this racetrack, if you will, where we go far away, trillions of miles as we go around this other star, and then we go trillions of miles closer to some third point out there. And as we do that, uh, then it changes our locale relative to other stars, and, it, and we speed up and we slow down. Now, we do know that uh, the sun can have profound effects on Earth, and that's our closest star. You know, just the fact that uh, the Earth spins on its axis cause, causes, uh, you know, electromagnetic spectrum when we face it, and we're in a waking state, and then when we go away from it, our bodies are adapted to go into subconscious state. So the spinning Earth actually indirectly affects consciousness. Obviously, the the revolving Earth orbiting the sun has a huge effect. Trillions of plant forms, billions of life forms will you know, migrate, spawn, hibernate, et cetera, et cetera. So if we're going around a third sun, it might have, or a third, having a third celestial motion, it might have some uh, effect on us, might have something to do with things in the electromagnetic spectrum we still don't understand. Check out the work of Hans Alf. Then, if you can, he's, I think, got some real clues there. I have to really rush here, sorry. There is a gal, uh, Valerie Hunt, at the University of California, Los Angeles. She's trying to figure out uh, how our bodies are changed by uh, just natural electromagnetism. You know, there's the solar wind is just pouring through us uh, right now and it's interacting with the magnetosphere of the Earth, and we need that to live. You know, we can't live without uh, the sun. And she found that if she puts people in a Faraday cage, a super kind of uh, thing that they test microcircuits in, very sensitive things, they can, uh, that people just don't like to be separated from the electromagnetic cocoon of the Earth. They feel very bad. So I think this effect going around this other star is somehow having a subtle energy effect on us and uh, over very long periods of time. 
This gets us into whole other ideas about what consciousness is about, which I... Check that book out. That, that's a good book. <laughs> <clears throat> that has a lot of the stuff that I don't have time to get into. I wish uh, I could really get into these, these ages because understanding the ages can be like a roadmap to where we've come from to where we're going. And that's the whole reason I'm doing this work, to, to help put this, these megalithic findings into context to, to explain why we had such knowledge, why it was lost, and, and why it's coming back again. Um, but the Greeks, uh, let me see if I can run ahead here to, lots of stuff was lost in the Dark Ages, except for a few monuments. Hesiod spoke so beautifully of the Higher Ages. He, uh, he told us that it was a time when the earth gave freely of itself, mankind communed with nature. Uh, we spoke one language. So to orient, orient yourself in this uh, great year, the, the binary process takes 24,000 years. That produces, you know, 24,000 year precession of the equinox. 500 AD is uh, when the autumnal equinox is uh, at the opposite of Aries, Libra Virgo. And uh, we're just about 1,500 years past 500 AD, so according to Euctiswar's teachings, or if you want to use the Greek terms, we've just come back into the Bronze Age. So we've moved from a time when we only understand ourselves as physical beings in a physical world to a time that we should begin to understand finer forces, according to the Indian writings on this. And sure enough, you find out uh, as we're transitioning here the last few hundred years, you know, since the Renaissance, which means rebirth of the cycle, uh, we discover electricity and magnetism and that, you know, stuff isn't so solid after all. It's made out of molecules and by golly, those molecules are made out of atoms and by golly, atoms are made out of almost nothing. <laughs> so, so I loved Anthony's work the other day. It was very bold and it was a little far out, uh, but I think he's really hinting at some of the possibilities that might exist in the higher ages because is we have no clue what the higher ages were like, you know. If we went back just 200 years and, and told a farmer around here, hey, we've got little cell phones and we can talk to people in China and we can clone your farm animals and we've got robots on Mars, it's not only that he wouldn't understand, you know, microwave and semiconductor technology and how we do all these things, he wouldn't understand why, you know. It just, there's no context for it. And it's, and I think that's what's happening. We have no context for understanding some of the very ancient cultures and, and what our future might be like. But, but the uh, Indians do talk about, uh, in the Iron Age, you know, man, maximum age is about 100 years. In the Bronze Age, you'll be 200 and then live older and older in the higher ages. And it's funny that you, you look at the old, uh, uh, dynastic lists in China, the, uh, the, the king's lists in, in Egypt, uh, the old Persian records. The farther back you go, uh, you get to these very long ages. And of course, if you have anybody that's supposedly lived, you know, a, a thousand years or something like Methuselah or Seth the, in the biblical stories, we always call that mythology, that that can't be true, that can't be real. But there may actually be some truth to it. Also, the, uh, the Indian teachings on this is that while in the lowest age we're bound by matter, in the age we've just entered, we start to overcome space. And it's, you know, you think about that airplanes, we can instantly, uh, you know, in 10 hours I came from the U.S. Uh, 8,000 miles away. Uh, so we're sort of shrinking space, if you will. And, in the next age, the Treta Yuga, we're supposed to overcome time, whatever that means. So everything's getting smaller and thinner, and hopefully we can just take the best of the technology and kind of get back to nature. And the age of the demigods is, uh, in the movies today, it's depicted as, oh, that's when a human marries a god. 
I think what the real teaching is, is that's when a human becomes a God, you know, when we're, when we're begin to realize that we're something much more. And, um, I, I probably have room for one last little story, you know, the biblical story, the, they're building towers at about the time that, that uh, uh, we're falling from the higher ages. And I think that a lot of this megalithic stuff, they know we're falling from the higher ages. They're trying to set up some mechanisms to try to hang on to some of the energies. And, uh, and yet God is confusing the tongues, you know. And when you try to understand the higher ages, I find the best source is actually talking to some of the saints and sages out there. And, and they say, oh, yeah, uh, common knowledge of telepathy and clairvoyance will, will be here again, you know, once we get to the Treta Yuga, which is 4100 AD. Which, which on this calendar of the, uh, the great year, that's just about when you lose it, about 3000 BC, before writing. Anyway, I think I'm near the end of the time, and uh, there's wonderful possibilities. I do want to make the final note that we don't have to wait till we go around this huge procession to bring back our own little golden age, if you will. There are certain things we can do to, to make that happen, and, and uh, even this uh, great sage here, you know, speaks of a time when we have these great possibilities, and and he would say that we don't have to wait uh, till the calendar gets back there. And Oh, and one last little thing. Sorry, Hugh. <laughs> People often ask, okay, well, what is it that creates this, uh, this great force, this sweet influence that brings us to the higher ages? And I have a few physicist friends that have been studying the Pleiades. There's some really odd things about it. Uh, I'll, we can talk about some other time, but there's this statement in the uh, Bible, the book of Job, canst thou bind the sweet influence of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? And my physicist John, Friend, John uh, Daring believes that, you know, it's our binary system that gets us a little closer to the Pleiades and at a faster speed it has a, an interaction with us that, that helps produce what we call this sweet influence. And, and here Job is asking a rhetorical question. And the answer, of course, is no. You know, we can't stay in the golden age of the, of the show any more than we can stay in the midst of summer because these cycles just have to go on and on and on.